All right, this is the third video, so you know the drill. E3 had indies. I played them. I want to share them, raise their awareness, and hopefully not horribly mispronounce their names. Sorry, William Cheer. Disclaimers, the games you're going to see here are in various stages of development. Some of them finished, others are in early stages. So they may improve over time, or they may not live up to their promises. Hype with caution. So to begin, a few honorable mentions. In Versus. It's a series of different modes centered around black and white blocks where you can shoot to reclaim your blocks against foes. It has some solid single and multiplayer modes and uses its simple mechanics in interesting ways. I had a little bit of time with the game and found it pretty interesting. Mare, or Mir, a VR game from the creators of the upcoming Pavilion. In the game, you guide a little girl around a castle to solve puzzles by tilting your head to tell her what to do. It has a very Ico or Shadow of the Colossus vibe, so if you're into those games, this might be right up your alley. And the final station. Think not a hero, but as a survival game with very limited ammo and resources. I really enjoyed the slower, more precise pace of the platforming sections here, and it's a neat take on combining action platformer with limited resources. Oh, another short disclaimer, some of the games here have some disturbing imagery and language to them and are unsuitable for younger audiences. Why do I bring this up now? That's why. Mother Russia Bleeds, the latest from publisher Devolver Digital, is the dev studio Le Cartel's love letter to classic beat-em-up style games like Final Fight or Streets of Rage, giving a much darker twist on the idea. It's a game that prides itself on being a very violent piece of entertainment, and after playing the first four chapters in the game, it's certainly going to earn its M rating. You can give punches, kicks, jumps, and grabs, giving different combos by mixing up your attacks and will help you boost your score. One of the main mechanics here is Necro, a kind of green ooze that you can use to heal yourself or go into Berserk mode. This limited power trip will speed you up as well as let you perform a brutal fatality the instant you grab an enemy. You can refill it if you find a twitching dead enemy and you just poke the needle and get a little bit of extra juice. Brutal. The game has four available slots for different friends to play in local co-op. According to the official Twitter account, online co-op will not be there at launch, but is a feature that they will try to incorporate afterwards. I played this alone for the first time, and it's a great way to learn the game with the different combo systems and the best method for fighting different enemies. If you're alone or have a spare slot, you can even bring an AI bot to play with you, which is a really neat feature. You can even have the three available slots all be bots if you'd like. Having more players on your team really makes the fights go by a lot faster, and if you're knocked out, a bot or a friendly player can revive you with some of their juice or HP, and you can do the same for them or other players. The AI isn't the most intelligent though, as playing it got a bot to do nothing right at the beginning, or just some weirdness that will end up getting me stuck once in a while. Uh, you, you wanna keep going? Come on? Yep. It took me a very long time to get through the fourth chapter of the game simply because of my AI partner not knowing what to do in certain situations. The AI partners are a really neat feature and I'm really glad they're here, but it doesn't replace a real life person. Playing the game alone or with a friend is very challenging here with a well-balanced difficulty curve, giving different baddies that have new attacks and groups for you to dodge and take care of. Each of the levels brings something new and interesting to the table, like grenades being thrown from a different train, or a boss fight where you have to run away from saw blades and use them to your advantage. The game does share some issues with beat-em-ups, such as waiting for enemies to come to your screen in order to beat them up some more. A bit annoying, but not that big a deal. Mother Russia Bleeds does have a few minor quirks that hopefully some patches will fix up, and then the time that I had with it, I had a lot of fun. It offers great variety with its enemy patterns and interesting design that evolves as you play, the game is well balanced for single and multiplayer action, and added features like the endless enemy versus mode, the game really feels like a worthy successor to beat em up royalty. It's been a while since we've had a really great game in this genre, and I'm really anxious to finish the full game when I get a chance. This is just shapes and beats. What is the game about? It's about shapes and beats. No, really, it is that simple. It's a rhythm game where you or a bunch of your friends are different shapes, and the object of the game is to avoid a large amount of other shapes on the screen going to the beat of the music. 
You may think that this is an auto-generating game where you can just throw in any piece of music and it'll generate a level, but everything here is designed by the developers to fit the well-balanced pace of everything. It's a really tough game, and it has all sorts of craziness to avoid, like explosions and bullets. It doesn't get too ridiculous with everything you'll have to avoid, though. I wouldn't quite call this a bullet hell game, I'd call it more bullet purgatory, if that makes any sense. To get to the end of each song, you have to reach each checkpoint with all of your lives intact, and to make it to the end. It's a lot easier and a lot more fun with a group of people, as if you get hit, they can revive you as long as they're able to reach your floating corpse in time. The game will also have the option for user-generated content to import your own songs and to be able to share them with the game's servers. At least, that's the plan so far. The dev team are trying to figure out a way for people to have that feature without a team of copyright armies declaring war on their game. Just Shapes and Beats, even right down to its name, is a very, very simple game. But it boils down gaming to its very core with what makes shmups and rhythm games fun, and even though it's very simple, it offers a fair and engaging challenge that will be tough as nails for loners, but a good time with a bunch of friends on a couch. It's hard to ignore that the indie horror scene has exploded within recent years, and nowadays, spooky games are a genre almost as common as the survival game. One of the highlights from this beginning boom of spooky indies is Outlast, a game where you have to rely on your camera with night vision to navigate your way around an insane asylum. I've only just played it for the first time about a month before the show, and it's scary as hell. Reminding my heart rate of why I don't play these games that often. So, because I'm an idiot who wants to give you the skinny on new games, I decided to brave the game's sequel at the show, and well... <laughs> it has its moments. The game has a new setting with a new journalist that's investigating a new cult out in the middle of New Nowhere, newly. It takes a lot of influences from real-life cults, such as the notorious Jonestown cult from the 1970s. If you've never heard of that, it's a highly disturbing piece of history, so Google that one with caution. The sequel shares the same mechanics as the first game, pitch dark environments where you'll have to rely on your night vision, and you'll have to recharge your camera by finding different batteries hidden throughout the area. With the outdoor setting, it takes advantage of more open areas, such as a cornfield filled with enemies that are looking for you. Right now, this section's just okay. Oh, wait, you want me to go in detail? Alright. The cornfield is a good idea for a horror game like this, being surrounded by different enemies while being in plain sight and trying to figure out a way to get past everyone unseen. The issue with this section is that it's fairly easy to get past the enemy's line of sight, as it was a bit forgiving, and I got through the section by just following the edges of the field and didn't really have that much of an issue getting past. Part of the strength of the first Outlast game is that it took you into areas you didn't really want to go through without a choice, and there are moments like that in the demo, but this section gave a little bit more freedom and drained a lot of the spooks that came from the scene. I know it's unfair to judge this game simply from its demo on what I assume is the easiest part of the game, so I'm hoping they'll have more elaborate and creative moments. Which is a perfect segue to talk about the game's story, which so far is pretty interesting. I can't give a lot away here, but it has some setups and enemies in the game that are a lot more vague this time around. They seem to be going for a much more psychological approach, examining what the main characters are about through its enemies. It takes a lot more creative liberties with its environments than the first Outlast game did. In a way that the early Silent Hill games used its enemies and its settings to help tell a story, I'm hoping that Outlast 2 will take the same approach. I know I'm speaking here without giving a specific example of what I'm talking about, but that will give away a lot of what the first level is about. The game has its spooks, and with the news that it's going to be delayed until next year, it may be ironing out its kinks and listening to feedback, but its story does leave me optimistic about the game and to see where the developers will take their cult classic series. One common trend in both mainstream and indie games is the idea that a specific person or job and what that entails would make a unique game by design. The Batman Arkham games are fun because being Batman and beating up people, sneaking around, and playing a detective makes for an interesting game. LA Noir works because it's interesting to play a detective by interrogating and determining if who you're talking to is telling the truth. Granted, these were both handled by competent teams who understand good game design, but still, an interesting job is sometimes enough to make an interesting game. I feel that the new adventure strategy game by Pixel Crow, Beat Cop, shares the same idea. 
The game has you play as a former detective that's been demoted to a regular patrolling street cop in a large city. Early in the game, he's involved in a murder case where he's one of the suspects, and he only has a few days to patrol the street, solve the case, and clear his name. Each day before you go into work, you're given a quota for writing tickets and what you have to do in each day, and then you're sent out in the streets to play the boy in blue. The key idea here is that you have constant things to do, like arresting people, having to check different cars if they need tickets, and different people in groups on the street that you have to try and please. The politics of being a police officer is the main mechanic here. In the game, you can choose to be a corrupt cop working with the mob, drug dealers, accepting bribes instead of giving tickets, and being pretty lenient towards general people, and this will help you raise money for things like alimony or gaining your stamina during the day. Or you can completely go by the book and follow the law by ignoring bribes, the mob, and not being forgiving to regular citizens trying to give out a ticket. All the choices here have consequences, such as being popular with the mob and the people will make you unpopular with the police, but following everything by the book will make you disliked in your own neighborhood, and the lack of extra money will make it difficult to pay alimony or get all the information for the different cases, including your own. Chances are, the first time you play the game, you won't have enough time each day to please everybody, and you'll have to find the right balance on your street to solve your murder and remain a cop. So to sum it all up in a sort of elevator pitch way, Beat Cop is like Papers, Please, where instead of dealing with the politics of being an immigrant worker in a crowded border, you're dealing with all the politics and choices of being a police officer in a big city. The game, even in the early playable state that it's in, does a great job at exploring some of these themes. This is a really challenging game when I first played it and dealing with all the pressures that you have to deal with, and even with some practice you have a very small window of opportunity to get everything done with a ticking time clock. Tickets take some time to write, running costs stamina, and you'll get dispatched to give you extra missions randomly during the day, and if you don't complete those, you'll get scolded the next day. It's the kind of game where the point of it seems to be that you can't win with everybody, and you'll have to decide how to balance everything. This is a game with a lot of depth, challenge, and great potential for interesting storytelling through its mechanics. It's going to take people a lot of practice to get really good at this game, but I'm really looking forward to this one. Tribute Games is a company that I have a lot of respect for. Their high standards for pixel art and dedication to old-school design with their own original twists have churned out some great little gems including Wizorb, Mercenary Kings, and the criminally overlooked Curses of Chaos. With their newest effort in Flint Hook, a procedurally generating dungeon-crawling action game centered around a grappling hook, they've raised their already high standards for something I'm very excited to play once it's released. Each map, or in this case, each ship, is set up like a lot of roguelikes, roguelites, or rogue-ish games where the rooms are different each time you go into a ship. The whole game has a nautical theme to it where it takes place in these flying vessels, has aquatic based enemies, and hooks are one of the main themes as that's how you'll primarily be going around. Each room will have you dodging obstacles, firing at enemies, and collecting treasure and the movement feels incredibly satisfying. Hooking, firing, and dodging didn't take much time to get used to, and the enemies offer a nice variety of different attacks and patterns to keep things interesting. Their previous game, Curses and Chaos, explored how to use simple but satisfying controls to dodge and time different attacks from enemies, and a lot of those lessons and ideas carry over to Flint Hook perfectly, with the added mechanics of a hook and gun to give some more added depth. One useful feature is the ability to slow down time to get more precise strikes and dodges, and you'll definitely need it. This is, of course, a procedurally generating dungeon crawling game, so there's plenty of different items, power-ups, secrets, and cash to find. It's all set up with a bounty system, where after you accept one bounty, you fight your way through four different ships to take on a boss. After defeating that boss, you move on to another bounty with a higher number of ships and a higher difficulty level. Earning coins in the game nets you XP, which you can use to unlock different perks, and you can equip them at the start of each run. There's also a black market in the game that will accept special coins to give you upgrades like raised MP and more slots for your perks. Flint Hook was one of the first games I got a chance to play at the show, and it was one of the first that I fell absolutely in love with. Its responsive control, terrific personality, and a hefty amount of value show a lot of promise for a fresh procedurally generating action game. It's one of the few games that I wish I had a chance to go back to and just play a few more rounds of. It's easily within my top five of the show, and I can't wait for this one to be released out into the wild.
Indicated section this year had a lot of local multiplayer games to offer to the masses at E3, but the one multiplayer-centric indie that impressed me the most there, partially because it was already a fully finished game, was Move or Die. It's essentially a collection of platformer-based mini-modes with one simple idea. If you stop moving for a short amount of time, you'll die and you'll have to wait for the next round. There's a nice variety of minigame modes here, such as throwing hot potatoes, dodging obstacles, making blocks your own color, and a wide range of other different modes to play. All this sounds really simple on paper, but it's really the execution of everything that brings it to the next level. For example, the development team has shown a lot of dedication to the game by adding a variety of free updates since it was on Early Access. One of them featuring Twitch integration, where if you're in the chat room, you can vote on different game modes that the person is playing, add lasers to the field, or even have your own chat messages appear in the game. You have a large variety of characters to play with, such as cameos of Shovel Knight and others being real-life faces, and there's even an option to give emoticons for your characters to taunt. There's a long list of extra modes to get your money's worth here, including daily challenges and missions, online multiplayer with features to add AI bots in case somebody drops out, a dedicated system to find different players online, the game even has a level editor available and access through the Steam Workshop with mod support. I only had a chance to play the game at E3, and a few Steam reviews are reporting a limited number of people playing online. Connection issues was another common problem according to the players. It's a pretty common problem in indie multiplayer-centric games such as this, and it looks like Move or Die is no exception to deserted multiplayer games. The game is clearly made by a dedicated team, giving a lot of extra goodies to an already solid base. I played the game for a few rounds at E3, and it was hard to keep a smile off my face with its solid control, great presentation, and the large variety in its gameplay. This may be a better game if you'd like to play it with a group of friends on the same couch, and if that's your jam, it's definitely hard not to recommend Move or Die. Creating and crafting your own tools, towns, houses, and magic are popular marketing buzzwords for many different games. Giving your own personal touch to what's right for you or your situation can bring a lot to a game, and Mages of Mistralia has a really unique take on crafting. It's an action RPG set in a colorful fantasy setting written by Ed Greenwood, the creator of the Forgotten Realms campaign from Dungeons & Dragons. It's a lot like 2D Zelda games, where you'll be battling enemies in an overhead view using a variety of different magic spells. Your wand can do short and long-range attacks to start, but the really interesting thing here is the ability to customize your spells. Using a grid in the game's menu, you can assign your magic to a different range of functions, such as multi-shots or the ability to lock onto your targets. There's a lot of customization to your magic, and the game's enemies and world are designed, so you'll have to figure out the right way and method to solve the puzzles or to defeat your foes. You can't just blindly customize whichever weapon just looks nice, you have to create it so it works best for the situation. The demo I played offered a good bit of challenge with the idea, as experimentation is encouraged to find the right spell and formation to take out the baddies efficiently. There's a lot of good potential with this idea. They can craft a variety of different puzzles and monsters that can take some imagination on the player's part to solve. The world also looks really nice and colorful here, having a good variety with its setting and characters. It certainly evokes memories of playing 2D Zelda games, but its combat here really makes it stand out. It's an impressive game so far, evoking warm nostalgia while keeping the combat really fresh and interesting. Really looking forward to this one. One of the more pleasant surprises for me to play at the show was the latest game from game designer and adventure game legends Ron Gilbert and Gary Winnack in Thimbleweed Park. It's a Kickstarter game that did very well for itself, raising almost double of its initial asking price, and is aiming to be in the vein of classic adventure games such as the team's own Maniac Mansion. The footage you're seeing here is very early, and it doesn't do the sprite work of the game justice. There have been a lot of classic adventure-style games made today, like the stuff from Wedged Eye Team and others like Kathy Rain, but Thimbleweed Park's presentation and sprite work really stands out here. Utilizing a stronger engine to create more detailed sprite work, it makes a lot of smart color choices with minimal effects like shadows and small things like a room rotating when you're inside of a trailer. It's a minor thing to bring up here, but the choices in color really did stand out the first time I played it as it produced a very crisp image. The same thing can be said about the game's writing. 
The team has some high standards with their development history, such as The Secret of Monkey Island under their belt, and the dialogue that I played in the demo here is sharp and hilarious. It's said to be a parody of Twin Peaks, True Detective, and The X-Files, and you don't need to know anything about those to enjoy the dialogue and the gags here. Even the short demo that I played there had a great sense of humor to it all on its own. And it's not just there to be funny, either. The demo tells the story of a very minor character, an insult clown comedian that has a pretty clever arc with its mini-story. I don't want to give it away here, but I do want to say it has some juicy science fiction themes playing out with the character. Thimbleweed, like its inspirations, isn't solely focused on its story, and the game has a fair share of puzzles to solve. The puzzles themselves are very clear and well designed, where I didn't need a guy. The feeling of accomplishment in solving these puzzles is ever present, and the team's signature blend of humor comes into the puzzle's logic as well. The game will also have a lot of variety, with five playable characters, and the Kickstarter promises full voice acting in the game. The team mentions that the voices will be optional if you enjoy reading over hearing, so you can turn the voices off and read everything a feature that I can see being really useful for streamers that enjoy reading the dialogue themselves. Thimbleweed Park was definitely a highlight at E3 this year. Its sharp humor hasn't aged a day, the puzzles are more refined and won't alienate newcomers to the genre, and the story itself is interesting. It's as though Ron and Gary never left the genre and presented how decades of industry experience can create a highly polished piece of adventure gaming goodness. It's getting harder and harder to find mainstream coverage of visual novel games these days, or even at E3 at all. It's a highly overlooked genre that has a lot of potential to boil down interactive storytelling to its fire strengths, while opening up the player's imagination like no other genre. The one, and to my knowledge only, visual novel game being shown off at the show that has a few interesting ideas up its sleeve was a horror game called Transfer, or Underscore Transfer. The game takes place in a blurred-out computer screen where everybody speaks to each other using a 1980s computer interface. It's a very vague game, crossing over from one conversation to the next, and is made to be purposefully confusing. You'll have very strange conversations with people where you're not sure if you're talking to robots, people, or in some cases, rats. The game encourages a lot of repeated playthroughs to get a better understanding of what the world is and how it works, and each playthrough is said to be very short. In the words of the game's developer, High Saint Nil, part of the goal of the game is to have the player question their notions of identity. Nil wants players to ask themselves, quote, where does the identity live within a person? It came from a conversation between Nil and the game's writer, Reed Lewis, on discussing their gender. Both Nil and Lewis are non-binary, meaning they're neither men nor women, and thought of the idea of creating a science fiction game based on basing identity on how people interacted with them, as opposed to having an internal sense of self. Again, creator's own words. And the early game reflects those ideas. No one gives a straight answer as to who they are, and viewing this through the lens of an old PC interface reflects on the disconnect with how you're interacting with them. The tone and conversations you'll have in the game are a bit surreal and a bit unnerving, so it fits the horror theme pretty well. Definitely not a kind of game that would alright scare you, but within the same ballpark. The game right now is about 35% done, and if this sounds interesting to you, the early alpha is available right now in itch.io. It's very short right now, as it only takes about 5 minutes to get through a playthrough, but it does encourage multiple playthroughs to get different interactions. This is certainly one of the more highbrow games I have to feature in this video, and I'm interested to see where the game goes from here. Outside of the realm of web comics and a few fan videos, whenever a piece of media revolves around different video game characters all living in the same world, it's usually not really all that interesting. It might be something to pander to fans of video games or be this weird product of marketing via Captain N. Then we have Rise and Shine, a colorful shooter from Spanish developer Super Awesome Hyper Dimensional Mega Team, because the Mega Group was taken, maybe unintentionally hitting on something really clever here. The game is about a kid named Rise that's in a world full of popular video game characters like Link, Marcus Phoenix, and the Ghost from Pac-Man that all live in the same universe called Game Earth. War is broken out on the planet, leaving tons of refugees and chaos everywhere. Using a talking gun that Rise requires, named Shine, he goes out into the world to stop the invasion and save the world. 
It's a brutally hard game where enemies can kill you very quickly and you'll have to rely on cover and smart strikes with a variety of different bullets. Some are pretty standard to shoot down enemies and others have special abilities like being able to manually control them to solve puzzles or to shoot enemies that are also kind of puzzles. As you can see, the art is hand drawn and really gorgeous here. The backgrounds are very well detailed and it has a nice amount of personality for its different characters. And while the game was really difficult to play at first, everything felt completely fair once you got the hang of it. You can't just rush in and take on enemies because you're pretty vulnerable. You're gonna have to take your time and get precise strikes. But the setting and the idea hit on something really interesting here. In a world where all video game characters exist, what would happen? How would they deal with a crisis like this? Would they all go to war with themselves and who would they side with? And with how different video game characters represent different ideals, who would survive? Rise and Shine is about shooting enemies with varied bullets, but it's also about colliding generations. It's about a hero that you might find in an innocent NES game from the 1980s, and he's fighting enemies you might find in modern games like Halo, Gears of War, or another violent shooter. How do games, characters, and the innocence that represents games from that time survive in today's hyper-violent market? Will that kind of innocence from previous generations live on? All of these ideas aren't spoken in the game, but it is something that the game is exploring. It's a sort of meta-reflection on the industry as a whole, and old-timers like myself reminiscing on if our innocence that we grew up with can even survive today. It's refreshing to see the idea of having video game cameos and appearances like this have some meaning rather than just have them for the sake of a punchline or pandering. It's a fun game to play with, but it does have something to say. And in comparison to a lot of other video game cameo-oriented media, it's a pretty genuine change of pace here. So after talking about over 30 games from the show, it's impossible to say which one is the best because most of everything is unfinished. But I did want to save my personal favorite game for last. I'm looking forward to enjoying all the games that I discussed, but for now, let's spend a night in the museum. It's a puzzle game very similar to Portal centered around perspective. The idea is that you can interact with different objects and depending on your view and angle, you can change its size to be bigger or smaller depending on your view. Using this, you'll have to figure out how to reach a certain platform or move to different objects in order to progress through the game. It's a highly inventive mechanic and the game provides a number of interesting ways for you to solve the different puzzles. You may have to go inside certain objects that are blown up, other objects that are hidden in plain sight in interesting ways. Every corner of this game felt fresh and interesting, giving more and more inventive new ways to play. The game is also one of the most laugh out loud funny games of the show. Here's a highlight. This is just from the early tech demo, but the game has a lot of clever and funny visual gags just like that. Its comedy has very little dialogue and really felt universal. It can be tricky to make objects grow bigger or smaller just to get your head around the idea, but even that was funny as hell. Trying to navigate and getting the objects to fit in just the right size had me fumbling and failing at times, and I still had a stupid grin on my face. This may not have the show-off-y visual art style of something like Cuphead, but its visual design gave me no confusion on how to solve the gags and keep the game challenging. I literally had to pry myself away from this game's demo, otherwise I never would have spent any time playing anything else. Museum of Simulation Technology is a game of enormous imagination. It's pushing the medium forward with level design, puzzle design, and personality. If the game continues to have its clever design and fresh take for the rest of the game, then this will be an instant classic, but right now, it's my best of show. And there you go, that's over 30 games in about a much longer time than I anticipated. Thank you very much for watching, and feel free to subscribe to hear about new videos in the future. Also, look! Stuff you can click on, like previous games from E3 that I played, and my latest review on Party Hard. A big thanks to Gerard the Completionist for getting me into E3, all of the developers, publishers, the mix, and everybody that helped make this video possible, and of course, you for watching. And internet, after months of not uploading anything to this channel, it's freaking great to be back. One of them featuring Twitch integration where you can- <laughs> <laughs>